Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the government and political correspondent for Western Wisconsin Journal. Today we have a special guest candidate, Patty Schachner. Patty, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Patty is a candidate for the 10th Senate District, which was just recently announced. So, um, you know, they came about kind of rather fast, the announcement that uh, Senator Harsdorf was being appointed as Secretary of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it wasn't too long after that, then a lot of people threw their hat in the ring. And uh, you did that. So we're going to ask you the why question. But uh, let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, where, you, where do you live? Where are you from? And uh, you know what, what uh, is in your background that would qualify you to run for this office? OK. So um, born and raised in Somerset, Wisconsin. Uh, have uh, me and my husband have been married for going to be 39 years in February. We have six kids, uh, six or nine grandchildren, so we're pretty pretty proud of that. Our kids all, my husband and I both went through Somerset uh, public education. Our kids all did. Um, we have uh, our kids have all had secondary education. All have went through some sort of coursework at WITC, and now we have uh, three kids that have been advanced their um, education to bachelor's, master's, and now one is going for a doctorate. And then we also have one that went totally technical, and he went down to Chicago for a trade down there. So we understand. So you guys had six children. Yeah. What are their age ranges? Uh, 38 to 25. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're all grown. So that's, yeah, they're, they're, we're pretty proud of all our kids. You know, we have two, two, two are veterans. So one is serving in the Navy right now, Dylan, and Travis was a veteran. So Okay, and you mentioned the grandchildren. Are, yeah. And uh, any of them current uh, students of public education in, in all of this them. area? All of them. Uh, I have four that are in, or three at the public school in Somerset and then public school in Anoka. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, there, my daughter teaches at the Blaine High School, so we do have ties to, to public education. All right. And we're going to get into the issues, I promise, but let's talk a little bit about your vocational background. Okay. So, uh, what have you been doing? Well, you, you mentioned that you graduated from Somerset. Mm -hmm. So, what have you been doing since then? So, my first uh, thing. Besides married and, and raising and kids. six kids, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, my first um experience with uh, technical school was when I was a senior in high school I took the CNA program so that was my you know first uh, experience with what was then called Avatech um, got married um, had uh, kids and then about 10 years after we were married went and took the EMT class and that just kind of really um, exploded for me I, I found my niche I found my passion it was not only serving uh, the public but really I found that I worked my best, my brain, it worked the best in chaos. I really strived in those, the crazy scenes that happen when you work in EMS. And um, so which community was that with? In New Richmond. Okay. So um, from there, uh, I went to EMT, EMTI, became the director of Star Prairie First Responders. I did that for 13, 14 years. Um, I uh, became a farm aide. Uh, instructor for rescue. I was a rescue officer, um, got to do the jaws of life and all that. I, you know, just, it was really good stuff for me. Um, got my certification to teach, so I taught EMT basic classes at WITC. And um, then down the line, I, I was uh, working as a, a temp at a local company and I got hurt and, and I had to kind of give up my EMS career because I just couldn't do them both at the same time. So I did and went back to school and I um, took some classes in floral design and opened up a small business in wedding consulting and got that at uh, floral design at WITC. I've done a lot of different things that way. So um, a small business owner, I'm hearing uh, some education in there, definitely ties to healthcare. Yeah. Uh, you haven't even got to the part about being medical no, examiner. So, no, no. Uh, when did that happen? <laughs> huh? Well, then um, I still I still lectured and did a lot of um, uh, 
consulting kind of work uh, with EMS. So I always kept those doors open. And then an uh, opportunity came to become a death investigator. So I threw my name in the hat. And it's kind of a natural segue to go from EMS into death investigation because right. of the basic premise of mechanism of, of injury. You right. understand it from an EMS perspective. Um, so put my name in and applied and, and got it. So in 2002, I became a death investigator. When you say applied and got it, is there somebody to appoint you? It's an app. It, at, it's a uh, it's an appointed position. The medical examiner is an appointed position by the county board, and then that person there hires their deputies. Okay. And that, and um, one of our deputies has been doing it for nearly 30 years. So okay. I mean, there's a lot of experience that that comes in with that. So it's uh, so there's deputy medical examiner. You're the head medical examiner. Yep. And there's three deputies. And so how long have you been doing that? Since 2002, and I got appointed to chief by the board in 2011. Okay. And, and uh, since then, um, at that time is when we really started seeing the shift in um, lethal uh, overdoses and suicides. So started doing some really advocacy work on, on that part. And uh, that's really where I kind are of you, made Are you part person. of some nonprofit groups as well? Mm-hmm. Uh, I created the, me and Keisha Marson created the, the Suicide Prevention Task Force of St. Croix County. And with that, we trained 7,000 people in St. Croix County, uh, Question, Persuade, Refer, which is an evidence-based suicide prevention program. We've been in every school district in the, in the county, so. And to some Rotary Clubs. Right? Yes, yes. We've done lots of, we've been out to whoever asks, we will go talk to them about it because we are that passionate about it. Okay, so suicide prevention, what others? Uh, I'm also on the board of Somerset Food Pantry. Um, uh, when I worked at the school district, I started to see how food insecurity was a huge issue. Um, and I lived in the community my whole life and I never knew it. My kids would tell me, you know, mom, you don't know what's going on, but I kind of just like they, you know, they're being dramatic. And really they were much more insightful about what was going on with their peers than I was. Okay. Um, you know, and, and kids being hungry is a, is a huge issue. Um, I'm also on the board for Turning Point. Um, my only experience with domestic violence is lethality. Okay. So I understand, you know, uh, domestic violence is a huge, huge issue and how we need to so in okay. the time that you've been with the medical examiners, roughly how many death investigations arose out of a domestic situation? Every homicide I've worked on has been through domestic violence and... That roughly one a year, like a dozen I'm in thinking, this area? I'm thinking, oh, about, it's like more like 1.7 a year because okay. we're, we have multiple. We've, right, sure. Sometimes yeah. there's uh, double right. homicide, right. suicide, whatever. The, right. Okay. It goes with it. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so, it's we a have some situation. criminal justice uh, connections there, mm -hmm. certainly with law enforcement. Um, you've had connections there for decades. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, prior to with the EMT part of it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, in the churches and the schools and the firefighters and the funeral homes and. You Did know, we hit on all the nonprofits then? Yeah, I think so. And then uh, your a vocation, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> all right, so let's get into the why are you running for state senate? Because it sounds like you're busy enough as medical examiner, <laughs> and unless you've had this passion since your first child that you were going to yeah. run for state senate in 2017. Well, what happened is I have, because I have a large circle of friends that are involved in lots of different things, um, when this started opening up and there was a conversation, I did have some friends that called and said, Patty, you need to do this. And I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. And multiple, multiple calls, Patty, you need to do this, no. And then my kids, we decided, my husband and I, that we should talk to our kids about this. And we told our kids, and our kids, uh, and especially my son Toby, he's like, Mom, you've spent your whole life telling us when opportunities come, you have to take it. It's better to try and fail than to fail trying. Okay. And then I said, when did you start listening to me? And I said, thank you, and put my name in the hat. Okay, now yes, you put, threw your uh, name in the ring or hat in the ring, so to speak. Um, 
But on the Democratic side, and I was just curious, is there long-term Democratic ties? Do you have to choose one party or the other? Are you solidly, you know, um, uh, a uniparty person or what? I have always leaned more towards Democrat. Um, that doesn't mean that I haven't been independent, you know, but my beliefs based on well, are That's you like a enough. lifelong party insider or? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> if all right. Uh, um, I, you know, um, I have uh, participated in the local Democratic events uh, throughout the years, but I've n not really been consistent. <laughs> yeah, some people say dues paying member or right. whatever. But, um, and we should emphasize that this, the date of this interview is December 12th, a week from today will mm -hmm. be a primary and you do face primary opposition. Yep, yep. And then after the primary, there will be a general and that's yep. in January. Correct. And the date of that is? 19th. No, wait, December 19th is the, the primary. primary. It's uh, January 16th, day after Martin Luther King Day. Okay, so you get a whole 28 days. Then yeah, for yeah, the, it's going to be a big push. general election. Okay. And uh, we have been uh, attempting to contact the various candidates, get them to come on the show. We've interviewed uh, the two Republicans who both happen to be already in the state legislature. Uh, and, uh, of course, oh, you know, we'll continue to reach out and try to get people, but a lot will be determined. Now the race will be narrowed mm -hmm. and what we see, and I'm not accusing anyone or anything, but many times in elections, usually though longer elections because state elections can be six months or more, mm -hmm. uh, depending on which office, uh, you see in prior to the primary when there's multiple people running, people run to the extremes. In the Democrats case, they run to the left and in the Republicans, they run to the right. And then after they get the nomination, then they run back towards the center. Are you planning to do that kind of gymnastics here in, no. in this race? Okay, <laughs> and tell me how so. Uh, um, I've been pretty open and honest on where I sit on, on the hot topic issues. I, you know, like I am a gun owner, so I am not anti-gun. I know that I will never get 100% rating from the NRA, and that's okay. Um, I am an advocate for gun responsibility and gun safety. I think that, you know, there are certain things that you can have, you can have a gun, but you are responsible for that gun and you are responsible for the, um, the securement of that gun. So it's not about banning guns for you? No. And no. it's not necessarily about gun control as much as it is gun safety? Well. I always go, okay, so banning guns, tell me how that's going to happen. I know there's about maybe 300 police officers in St. Croix County. How are they going to do it effectively? It's not going to happen. Right. So it's a, it's a argument that's created to cause fear when there is no reasonable way that you could do that. So it, it, it just should be, you know, it's a reasonable it's time to have a reasonable conversation and not cause all this panic that this is gonna happen. Because what happens is we have a, a horrible incident like what happened in Las Vegas, and then the first thing that happens is they're gonna ban the guns and then the gun sales go up on assault rifles because everyone wants one now. Right. So the people who are making money are making money. And the people who weren't gonna buy them didn't buy them. But the people who had them now have five and then right. they have 10, and it, it, just, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it just, so let's have a reasonable conversation about this, and you can have guns, but when is enough enough? And what, what is it that are reasons that maybe you, it's not that you shouldn't have a gun, but maybe someone else should safely keep that gun, gun until you're in a better place. Right, and your examples would be obviously uh, domestic violence mm -hmm. and uh, mental health. Yep. Then. Yep. I, yeah, I, you know, if, if you say you have to take them away from people forever, you're saying you're taking their hope away that they'll never get better. Right. With the right treatment and the right programs, I would like to believe that we can all get better to do better. So um, I, you know, I think that if we are reasonable, and people understand that it's reasonable that they will work harder to do better to get that back. 
Right, and you mentioned about being a gun owner, uh, your husband being a former NRA member. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, did I see in your literature you were part of the Bear Hunters yeah, Association? Yeah, we, yep, we bear hunted. Um, and, uh, you know, we bear hunted for, my husband actually bear hunted this year, but us as a family bear hunted until 2006. And we made a conscious uh, decision to quit bear hunting uh, when he had his heart attack. So okay. we just, uh, we all decided that we just didn't want him in the woods anymore. So we quit that and he bought a tractor and now we do tractor pulling. So he went from, from one hobby okay. to another. <laughs> uh, when we were, I was asking you, so let's get, get to the uh, what. Uh, what do you plan to do as a center? What would be your platform then? Um, because other than, are you just adopting the Democratic Party uh, full bore as far as what their priorities are? Or what would Patty Schachner do in the Senate? My primary platform would be to work out options and opportunities that are best for District 10, like a regional mental health facility or tra uh, treatment center. We don't have those options. And if you, you know, there's a lot of options when you get further east because they have a higher population, but we don't have them options. Um, you know, and mental health and addiction is not just kids and young adults, it's our seniors. You know, and when you have seniors that have Alzheimer's or dementia or Lewy bodies, and 25% of the people in St. Croix County, just St. Croix County, who are diagnosed with a uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, or Lewy body, have nobody to take care of them. So by the time they get into the system, they are that person that's in crisis. We can do better. We can figure out how to get these people the help that they need um, and, and do it in a way that's cost effective because what we're doing now is not cost effective to the system as a whole. It's a you were mentioning about not having a, a regional treatment facility and what that means to the law enforcement officers here and to law enforcement budgets here. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just explain a little bit? You were talking to Officer Williams. Yeah. So for just one example, um, when I talked to Officer Williams of, Williams of Hudson, he said they had, and this was last week, they had 22 transports to Winnebago. Well, that's a five-hour ride. And usually what happens is at the end of the shift. So if you've already put in your eight hours and then you gotta drive five hours and then you gotta drive back five hours, you know, you're talking overtime, you're talking officer safety. Can you even do that? You have to bring in other people to do those transports. That all costs money. So there has to be a way that we can fix the system that we have. And these people have medical conditions. They don't need to be handcuffed and put in the back of a police car. What they need is help for what is going on with their brain at that given time. So we have to figure out the way the law is written right now puts law enforcement as the primary person for transport. What are some other options? Can the medical doc, can, can a person who's in crisis, can we use a telepsych? which is much more effective, and it's starting to come around here, but can that be part of it? Can we utilize the crisis network in a much more effective way? And if we do, you know, even the crisis network, people are like, well, I have to pay for it. Well, we have to figure out how that works because we can't be transporting everybody across this, the state when we don't have access here. Okay. So it sounds like healthcare a big issue. Any more th on healthcare that you wanted to address? Because, nope. well, one of the things that I'm hearing um, just with Wisconsin's budget, we have, first of all, we have a mandate. We have to have a balanced budget, mm -hmm. and there's been a big push over the last uh, nine and a half years or so to, uh, you know, cut taxes um, and, you know, reduce that, the size of government. Um, and in the end, it obviously comes down to priorities. So where would your priorities be in that process? Well, my priority would not be popular <laughs> at okay. that. But based on the Wisconsin burden of alcohol study, the state of Wisconsin spends about $6 billion a year on the ramifications of alcohol, whether it's lost productivity, uh, injury, um, court system, all those things. It, it costs us a lot of money. In St. Croix County, we pay about $1,200 per uh, person, man, woman, and child, for our alcohol problem. Pierce County is 1,300, uh, Polk County is So obviously 900. those numbers are incorporating a lot of our uh, Justice Department yep. and incarceration and, and probation and so forth. 
Yes, and we take in $55 million in alcohol tax. Okay. Something's so, not even there. No, and okay. look what we did to cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And we could, and, and you know, it's that there, that is a huge problem. And we have to figure out how to balance that out. Oh, yeah, people are going to be upset because they don't want to hear raised taxes, but that's a tax that only the users are going to be affected by it. If you don't drink alcohol, it's not going to bother you. But uh, what people don't realize, well, that's fine for the people who have alcohol problems, but I don't want to have to pay for that, but they are already. They're, yeah, we are already, and the price just keeps going up. And so I'm sounding like your philosophy when it comes to government is more ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yep. Very, thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, um, so, and, and you have some perspective in small business. Um, do you think that uh, the push from the right is quite a bit on um, getting rid of regulation? Would you admit that we have some outdated regulation and so forth? Do you see it inhibiting economic growth? I think that uh, the word regulation um, is used as, as a way to um, navigate through that conversation. I, I like to think more of protections, mm. and and you know, and if what we're doing is not causing harm to anybody else, then I, I think we need to look at them. But if we're talking about dumping chemicals or sand drilling or those type of things where other people can be affected, even high capacity uh, manure. So you'd, you know. be, you'd be in favor of a substantive review of the pros and cons of a particular regulation. Right. It, right. I think that everything needs to be looked at because things change. It, every, things change all the time. And if you're not looking at your regulations um, to make sure that they're up to date with what's going on, um, and what, the right, and what the public benefit is. I mean, usually when it comes to regulation, you hear people talk about, they use the word right in front of it, job killing. Mm -hmm. So every regulation is a job killer. But for instance, when there was the push to raise the levels, legal levels of arsenic in our water mm -hmm. level, I mean, in the end, there is some common and mm -hmm. public good in having safe levels. Yep, yep. And, uh, well, and it's, it's interesting because, you know, people will talk about chemicals and safe water and all this. and. Recently, I got a report from a animal lab um, in California because we had done some testing um, through my work, and they were had they've had cows now in California that have died from nitrate poisoning, okay, in in the hay. And I thought, well, that's interesting. That's you know, and it's a conversation that we have around here. So it's like, I'm not saying that it's there. But if there's a possibility, and we already know this is happening somewhere, then why aren't we looking to make sure that it doesn't happen here? So that's why we would have a regulation to at least monitor that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you wonder, too, if those cows died from it. What about the cows that didn't die from it? What's happening to their meat and their milk? Right, if, right. Uh, it's not to a lethal degree of the nitrate. Yep. So, um, okay, well, what other... Um, uh, is there any other stereotypes you want to either knock down or, or build <laughs> up when it comes to your candidacy and happen to have the capital D behind your name? Um, uh, education is a huge, huge uh, proponent. I do sit on a school board, so like you. <laughs> um, I, you know, sat... I assume that's Somerset. Yes, in okay. Somerset, yep. Um, I understand how hard our teachers work, and, and I also truly empathize with how much they were villainized through the whole Act 10. That's not to say that our teachers have not evolved. We, they have done everything we have asked them to do. And still, for some reason, public education gets a bad, a bad rap. And finally, we, had, we touched on education, the fact that you've been on school board. You mentioned your town board experience. Anything else as far as your experience for serving in this area? We talked about your work experience, small business owner, et cetera. And, with uh, interactions, obviously, with law enforcement. Um, I, I just think I bring to the table a very well-rounded experience with, with people from both sides of the aisle when our relationship is the most raw. Okay. I have, I have uh, seen the best and the worst in people, and we have always been able to come together. And I think that's something I can bring to the table. Um, Maybe it's the motherly link thing in me, I don't know, but I, I have the ability to um, not buy into a lot of the 
the, the chirping that goes on. And just I just want to know the facts, and I want to know what's reasonable. Okay. I, I, that's what makes sense. And, and as, long as, it's, as long as we're doing the right thing, you never go wrong. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds like a good plan then. Uh, Patty, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I want to remind the voters to vote in the primary on December 19th, and then the general is the third Tuesday in January. Yep, day after Martin Luther King Day. Okay. Very good. And uh, thank you for joining us for another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal.